Good morning. Uh, nice to see you all here. Uh, can I just, before starting up, find out how many of you are entrepreneurs? Put your hands up. You consider yourself. That's excellent. So we have some exciting people here. How many of you are within what I would call life sciences, uh, medtech, biotech? All right. Do we have some hardcore drug development people? Oh, thank you. Ah, that's good because then at least I won't be on deep water here because then you'll probably believe most of what I say. Um, I will um, try and cover uh, three main areas. I was asked to look at what are the trends within drug development. This is a very big uh, subject, so I've tried to concentrate on a uh, few areas, uh, mainly uh, orphan drug status, and a little bit about the importance of knowing what it is that you're actually developing. Then I was asked to do a little bit about lessons learned, and there is one lesson which is learned the hard way. Uh, that's about uh, your ownership and your thinking about your company, where you are when it finishes. And then I was asked to look at some examples, and I'll close off with an example in a company that where uh, I was one of the first investors, uh, or the fund I was uh, administering at that time, and that came out with a lucky, uh, well, a very good ending with a sale of an exit of the company. Um, today, uh, I uh, actually, in August of this year, started co making life science advices. Uh, among uh, the, the good people I have uh, in the network is uh, Seppo, as we'll see in a minute. Um, we uh, advise on commercialization. And our uh, catchphrase is connecting science to market. And there is a lot of things in between. And the problem sometimes is when you come from science, you think that once you've done your part, developed a new device, got a new drug, and it's ready. It's the best thing since sliced bread, as the Brits would say. Now, of course, then everybody will just take it off the shelves and buy it. But there is, that's, is just not the case. And that's a, that's a lesson learned for many people and many people the hard way. So we try to help in, in, in looking at that part of it. And of course, getting there, it takes money. And fundraising is a very difficult task. And it is more difficult these days than it has been for a very long time. Uh, we also help in, in, in many other ways. Um, I'll skip this one. I have uh, 17 years of experience in the pharma industry with Lundbeck, uh, a Danish, bio uh, Danish pharma company. I was CEO of their UK operations for seven years with uh, several hundreds of salespeople, detail men as you would call them in the US, and uh, pushing our products out to the doctors and getting them to prescribe. We had a billion Danish turnover. And, and uh, I moved over to the life sciences, into the biotech company, did uh, all the uh, small startups and enjoyed that so much. And then I was lured over to the dark side. And this is not a joke, this is the dark side. The venture capital is dark side. I have now noticed it and I've left them again so I can say this without any repercussions at all. Uh, this is the team at Life Science Advices, uh, SEPO, as you've just heard excellently. Uh, covering diagnostics uh, and with a very strong background in venture capital and the fundraising part of it. Uh, Jette Bjorn covering the med tech and med devices, also on the health IT side. Uh, Tom Skarsfeld, who is on, on the clinical development side and the regulatory side. And John Paul Jacobson on the commercialization side. So, what do I want to talk about? I want to give you an in insight into some of the things in, in, in trends in drug development. And when I say trends, it is not using the latest scientific equipment. It is not using the latest molecular whatever. It is what makes the f people with money tick. What, does it, what do they think is good for them? And one of the things is actually the value of orphan drug designation. Uh, I'll come back to what that is. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about what is the importance of actually knowing what it is that you're in the process of developing. So the, um, the constraints that we have on, on, on the R&D part of uh, drug development is, is basically there is a lot of cost cutting happening. We are not having the efficiencies out of it. We get fewer drugs approved. And there are uh, tougher reimbursement requirements. 
uh, smaller product lines, and especially for a lot of the major companies, there is generic competition because they run out of patents. There are uh, Lipitor and you name it, and many of the big uh, blockbusters are running out of patents. So there is a desperate hurdle to find the next one, but the efficiency is not yet there. So this is a typical drug development process for those of you who don't know it. It, it is uh, basically you have about 10,000 compounds and you have about six to seven years to go into the preclinical. You have 250 compounds and then you go into the clinical trials. You've got about seven years. You've got a phase one, phase two and a phase three. Then you get approved and then you have one single product at the end. Now, if, that's was you, if this was your money, would you invest in a company here? Well, probably not. If we look at it in a slightly different way, these are, I'm sorry, it may not be as clear here, but this is where the patent is filed. So if, if, if you come out of, of the, the, the bath in the morning and you say, I've got a brilliant idea, goes in, writes the patents, sends it in, and, and finds that there are not anybody else who's got this brilliant idea of developing a new compound, whether it's a chemical entity or whether it's a, a novel molecule, uh, then you have to I identify whether it is actually toxic, whether it damages, in first instance, animals. Um, and then uh, you have a whole host of uh, years that you spend testing your idea at. And again, only later on you come into the clinical phase one and the phase two and the phase three. So what does the risk profile look like? What, does it, what, is, the what is the chance of success? If we look at the chance of success, it goes this way. So the chance of success is very, very small at the beginning. And it becomes more at the end. So where, from an investment point of view, would you put your money? Definitely not here, and more likely here. So what we see is that there is actually a window, a, an investment window, a window of opportunity where uh, venture capital, mostly, uh, invest or have invested in this area. This is the early stage, this is the seed part of it. But what we've also seen is that it has actually moved over the last few years. And it has not only moved, it has also become smaller. So nowadays, if you want to do deals with Big Pharma, if you want to get funding from venture capital, you have to move the project further ahead than you would have five years ago. So that is a, a, a big dis, uh, uh, consequence. And the problem is, how do you fill that gap? How do you fill that with money that could keep you running? And, and, and that is definitely one of the major trends and challenges in the development of a drug, because you die before you even get there. I have been managing uh, three different funds in Denmark, and we have closed a number of companies not for lack of scientific results, but for lack of money. Lack of confidence that we are in the right space. So if you're right here, and you've just completed your phase one, phase one, what does that tell you? Phase one tells you that the drug is not toxic, that it doesn't damage or harm people. It doesn't tell you whether it works or not. And what does the investor want to know? They want to know, does it work or not? I mean, I'm not going to buy a car that I know is safe because it stands still, it can't drive. I want to know how fast it goes and one to zero to 100, and these days miles per gallons if you're in the US. So that is really the big difference and the, the difficult part of it. And that is a, a trend that everybody will have to look at and, and, and find out how to, uh, how, to, how to deal with. One of the ways is to look at whether your effort can be put into the orphan drug status. And if it can, then you might be able to go a little bit faster than the current, the, the usual route of phase one, phase two, phase three, and then approval that we just saw before. You might be able to come into a situation where you can actually do with less trial and come quicker to the market. Uh, and, and, and that, 
cuts out a lot of this cost and costs, uh, costs uh, and, and also brings you into play for, for investors because they look at this area as more attractive these days than the very long and especially as we heard from Seppo earlier on, with 10-year funds, it is a long period of time. It is a very long period of time. But 10 years in the life of a drug development is short. I mean, that's, we're just getting started when we get to 10 year. So often drug designation, it, it basically provides uh, a, a, a new route to identify it for diseases that are very rare or where there is no treatment available. One uh, in example that I'm working with in a company in the cancer field is a glioblastoma, uh, which is the brain cancer, which where at the, at the very end of a brain cancer there is no uh, proper treatment today. So that is an orphan drug opportunity. Now, that is a big market, and if you can get into there, you can actually charge very high prices for your product. So you don't need to sell that many. So you could actually charge 20,000 euros for a treatment that you need three times before in a year. So you suddenly you've got 60,000 euros for one patient. Now, then the economics starts to work in your favor, and it works in your favor, it will also work in the favor of your investor. So what we have seen is actually, we've seen over the last few years, these are figures up to the last year, that we have seen a boom in the number of applications for orphan drug designation. And we will also see the uptake in the actual approvals. So that, that I is a trend that is, is worth uh, considering and worth looking at. So what does it also give you, the orphan drug part of it? And I think uh, it gives you seven years market exclusivity, and it gives you access to grants and tax credits, uh, both in Europe and in the US, um, and you don't have to pay the, the major fees. But one of the real, real big benefits is that you get to go into a dialogue with the FDA and the EMEA in the Europe, where you can actually get their advice for free on how to design your next study, on how many patients you need in there. Do you need 30, 35 or 350? 350 is 10 times as expensive than 35 or 15. We have seen drugs approved on 15 to 20 patients if the condition is rare enough. So there, there is a, an, an excellent opportunity to get the help and support that you need in to, to make that uh, entry into the marketplace. And uh, just to, to see that there are actually some deals happening out there, uh, the big guys are also willing to pay for companies working in this space. We have seen a, a, a few deals le recently, and I'm sure that one of the trends that we will see is we'll see a lot more deals happening with orphan drug companies because they're an easier bite to go for. Because if you have, as a big company, you have to buy a company up in a phase two level, you still have to pay a lot of money to go through phase three. You still have a lot of risk uh, there, and they are risk averse by default. Um, so that was a little bit about orphan drug status, and I think that's a trend. It's, uh, it's something that's worth looking more into if you're in, in those areas. But I think it's also one of the things that we have looked at is, uh, is it is important to know what it is that you're trying to develop and what is it that you're actually trying to get out to the market. So when you have a, a drug or a biologics or whatever you have, you need to look at it not from the scientific point of view alone. You have to look at it from what is it going to be used for, what is the indication, and you have to go into every very little detail. You, look at, you have to look at what dosage do you need, how it's going to be administered, is it going to be e easy or not. Uh, a, a very a simple example is um, if you have a tablet that is not once daily and you have to take it two times or three times a day, you think, oh, that's not a problem. Yes, it is. In terms of compliance, it's a huge problem. And if your major competitor comes out the next day with something that is not nearly as good, but it's once a day, they win. So you have to go into those kind of details. 
you have to look at what are the contraindications, you have to look at the warnings, your adverse reactions and so on. You have to look at what is going to be on the data sheet, what is it going to tell to the doctor. I had an example, we launched a, a, a um, sleep product a few years back, a license deal I did wi with uh, Wyeth, and um, on the actual data sheet, or, or in the promotional material, and the way that we were trying to sell it was that this was uh, a non-benzodiazepine, it was non-addictive, so it was more safe. But in the small print of the data sheet, it says, can only be taken for two weeks, maximum two weeks. So what signal did that send? One way you're saying it's safe, but oh, don't take it more than two weeks because then you're in trouble, right? So you have to make sure that the data that you're producing very early on support what you want to say in the very end. So there is a whole uh, host of things, and, and, and in, in, in short, they're packaged into what is called a target product profile. And, 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 and rather than going through all of it, and, and I know the slides will be available for everyone afterwards, I've, I've actually given the, the web address where there is a whole uh, paper that, that gives the help to go in and, and see what does it need, what does it mean in that. And I think for the, anybody considering that, it's, it's, it's really worthwhile um, considering and, and reading. It's a good read. So those were a little bit about the, 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 the trends. Um, if we look at what, what does a, an investor look at, uh, this is from uh, Frost and Solomon. These, they, they always look at what are the drivers and what are the constraints in, 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 in a given industry. And here we see that the, the, the consolidation and the collaboration within the different industry are things that are moving in, 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 in favor of, of driving it. The personalized medicine, where diagnostics comes in, the companion diagnostics comes in and plays a role. That is one, one of the trends. Uh, the whole changes in, in, in technology, both in terms of uh, diagnostic, companion diagnostics, that, that helps in, in diagnosing the right people and treating them, but also uh, the, the whole area of antibodies and, and, and biologics. Uh, the, there's a whole new host of, of, of specialized medicines. Um, and there is also, in, in some countries, a, a, an increased privatization, and this is, again, what is the role of one versus the other, and how much is the empowerment of the, uh, the individual versus the state. But what drives it the other way? What are the constraints? And that is definitely funding, funding, funding. Money, money, money. That is one of the major constraints in, the, um, in raising for, for uh, life science funds that invest in small companies, they need to raise money, but also m the, the, the actual companies themselves. Um, the exit market, this uh, exit market is, is not what the, the green sign at the back is, that is the venture capital way of telling, selling it, uh, hopefully at a profit, and cross my fingers. Um, that, is, that is not as attractive as it was a few years back. And uh, the development costs are increasing, and the regulatory uh, powers are, are getting more troublesome. So there are a lot of things pulling the other way for not to invest in this area. So uh, I know some of you are in, 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 were in the IT space and, and, and other spaces. This is, uh, this is an example of a typical startup financing cycle. So it's not life science or biotech specific, but basically, do, do you all know the three Fs? Everybody? Is anybody? No, nobody? Okay. Then I can ask anybody who knows what the f three Fs are. Oh, there's one who admits there. Friends, family, and fools. Now, when you've done it once to fa family, then there are no more money left, so they're poor. When you've done it once to friends, they're no longer your friends. So you only have really the fools to count on for continued support. And that is a troublesome way of starting a company and running a company. This is uh, typically the, the, the valley of death, and uh, this is the area where you here are trying to start up a lot of initiatives. Smart Start is the straight road into the valley of death. Now, the good thing is you have some people who know this and they are going to guide you through it and out the other end. But 
trust me, you're not going to be the same person going out you were when you came in. You will have lost hair or it will have gone gray. Now, in life science, unfortunately, this is, this is uh, a good IT company. They need the money. They get some uh, initial customers. They start getting money in. Then, they get, then the, the uh, venture capital look, oh, well, we've got a company here who's actually making money. We'd like to invest. And then moves on. Problem for us working in biotech, life science, medtech, is that this is our curve. The valley of death is longer. It is hotter. The sun shines more. And it's filled with scorpions all over the desert. So what can we actually do to, to fill this gap, the valley of death? Well, there are actually a few things that you should do, and you should do in a very conscious and a very structured way. And, and that is look at soft funding and look at whether you can do partnership deals. Soft funding is the broad term for EU seventh program, any other Eurostars, or um, I misspelled that when I see Eurostars, but it's Eurostars, any local and regional programs. Any public funding you can get in, just do the, the time, take the time, write the application, do it. Because it's money that's non dilutive and it's money that will help you to get through. Another way is, is, is through partnership deals. And if you have a technology that you can actually slice up. Some, sometimes you have a technology working with a diagnostic company in Denmark where they, there, is a, a, there is a platform technology, it's microfluidics, and they are working in the veterinary space, but the same technology can be used in the food testing space. Ah, well, maybe we do a deal on the food testing space that gives money in to the company that uh, supports the whole company and the development of the company. Now, that is a good way of slicing it up. You focus in on a small area that you want to keep and you want to keep, but you look at all the other areas to see whether environmental testing, in this case, whether it could be human side of it, it could be many other areas, or even within the veterinary space, you could carve out small spaces into that. And that is a very good way of keeping you running and have some water so you get through the valley of death. You can also go into limited geographical deals. Seppa told me about a deal that they were doing in one of the companies in Korea. Brilliant. That would be nice. Because Korea is probably not the first market you will address from, from Estonia, nor from Denmark, for that sake. Um, and then sometimes you, you, you have to go a little bit back and see, are there any other services we can do to generate a little bit of money? But it is what it keeps you alive. And it is only if you reach the very end if you reach here, that you get your reward. And that comes me very nicely over to the next point I would like to talk about is the reward. How many of you have started a company? Okay. How many of you owe more than 50% of that company today? Okay. How many of you expect to own more than 50% of this company when it's sold? How many expect to owe more than 2% of that company when it's sold? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, you all know the, the effect of ownership and dilution. And this is, this is, this is one of the points that I... This, this is where my experience from the dark side really tells me that this slide, don't look at it. Don't think about it, because you all know the mechanics of this. If your company is worth, in this case, half a million before it comes in, one million comes in, then you have one third of the company. Yeah, it's very simple math. I don't want to teach that. If you have one million in, you have one million pre-money, you have 50-50 each, right? Is that right? Okay. So, let's just do an experiment here. Let's... Um, have we got, have we got a, f a founder, an early stage investor? I need a... Um oh, somebody took a glass. Sorry. So I need a few, uh, a few volunteers. So um, let's see. 
Who would like to be a founder? You look like a founder. Take one glass. Now, you have a f a, 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 an excellent idea. I've already had my glass. Yeah, that's no good. <laughs> you've, got, you've, got, uh, you've got lemon in there. That has bad taste. Um, so, that's, let's, let's say that that's worth a million euros. Right? You've really done well. So you go in and you want a, 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 an, an early, early stage investor. And I think this might just be an early stage investor here. So you have one million that you want to put into the company. And now the together you have two million. You own 50% each. You're happy. You start developing the product. Everything goes well. Everything moves according to plan. You need more money. That's the plan. So um, we get a Series A investor here. There is a guy here. He looks very serious. He's a Series A investor. So he's got a, a, a million um, for, for, for you. Actually, he's got a million, but he's got one condition that he would like to have a preference share. So rather than your A shares, he would like to have some B shares. The B shares have a preference right of 2x. I'll explain that in a minute. 2x is that he wants his money back two times before anybody else gets, once the company is sold. Now we have somebody with a lot of money. Everything is going well. And this is the rich fund. He's got a lot of money. He's got million euros put into the company, but it's a little bit risky at this point because you didn't meet all the milestones you said you were going to reach. So I think it's more risky now than it ever has been. And you're desperate because there's nobody else with any money out here. So you'll take whatever conditions he, 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 he wants, right? So you and the seed investor say, yeah, that's okay. Well, I'm sure they're good guys. So he goes in and says, okay, I want a 3x on my investment. So I want my money back three times before the rest of you get in money. Okay, this is one of the good cases where you don't go bankrupt, where you don't run out of investors, where you actually make it to the end. And here comes, we have a very good, uh -huh. and now somebody is probably taking a little bit of the money away from it, right? <laughs> Been drinking here. So, but the good thing is, we've got a big American company say, yes, we want to buy you. We're going to buy this company. So, and we're going to pay all of this money for you. So, I'll actually chop it up a little bit just to make sure, because this is the negotiations. We really push them to the heart, to the best. So, very much. Thank you very much. So, we've got our investor here. He would like to have his money back. He's not greedy or anything, he's just thirsty, right? Okay, so, okay, <laughs> and then of course our uh, um, B shares here, they also need some money. So, okay, there's still something left here, but of course, then we have transaction cost, an investment banker, and myself, I'm getting thirsty. And then, of course, you're as a seed investor, you're, you've taken the biggest risk. You've been there for them. You've been in the board for eight years, and it's really been a good ride, and you've got a good success to write down on your CV, and nothing else. And then, of course, oh, sorry, this is the seed. This is the seed, and this is the seed investor, and this is the founder. You get each nothing. <laughs> now you do laugh, right? But for the seed investor and for the original founder, it's not a laughing matter. I've been in investments where three X was. Not the last share class, 
the last share class had five eggs, right? Considering an investment of five million euros in the last round at five X, whoa, that really makes a difference. So you can drink the water now. Uh, and if you're really good, you will share a little bit out. You, you'll, you'll, um, you'll give a little bit of options, uh, warrants to, to, the, uh, to the founder. Um, but this, this is some statistics. This is real statistics in the area of biotech. These are companies that have gone IPO. And I, I, I'm sorry you might not be able to read it down at the back, but I thought it was important as part of the pack to have this data. And th this, this is the, m the sales, how many people there were, uh, when they were founded, and all of this. But out here, this is the number of founders left in the company, and the founder's age, and how much they owned at the end. So all of the trades that has happened in the last couple of years have 1%, 1.6, 2.2, 5.4, 6, 1.9, 1, 1, 3. That's what they end up with. So you really have to do it for the love of science. Or you have to squeeze them in some other way or choose your investors with really, really carefully. So that's um, lessons learned. Um, let, me, uh, let me turn to an actual uh, concrete example. This is a company that um, uh, I was a member of the board for uh, for what, five years, and uh, we sold it earlier this year uh, to um, to Abbott, and we did a very good deal, and we were very happy. Everybody around the table were very happy. Uh, it's a typical uh, life science company, established in 2000, now sold off in 2012. So Seppo's point about 10-year funds is uh, probably right. There's a bit of a difficulty there. There were a lot of uh, big venture funds in there. Sunstone Capital, the biggest fund in Denmark, Global Life Science uh, in Germany, Innovationskapital in, in Sweden, SLS in Sweden, um, and uh, the fund that I was representing in Kuba Venture, uh, the, uh, the next after the seed investor. So ours was not full, but it was, it was there. Um, they had a, a one asset at the very end, but I will just tell you a little bit about the journey that they have been through because this tells you uh, how how much hardship you have to go through. Some of the milestones is the company was established back in 2000. The technology that they based on was in licensed in in uh, 2003. They had a series uh, seed capital seed investor in 2001 and the Series A financing in 2003 to 2006, 51 million Danish kroner, and this was where my fund came in at that stage. So I think we invested first time in 2000, end of 2003. Um, and then we had a Series B round with the big guys and ourselves. So Sunstone Capital came in 2007, and then we had even a, a C round with uh, international capital and so on. So we had actually worked eight years before we got some really big investors in, and that moves us very ahead. Here, we hit a stumbling block. Our major project didn't work out as expected. And then we had some restructuring, and then we had a sale of the uh, project onto Abbott. So I'm, I'm going to take you through this as a case story because it, it, it has a lot of good learnings in it. We had a, a situation at the end of 2009, right? So this is nine years after start. And this is not the first disappointment, I have to say, unfortunately. But our lead compound, which was a, an, an oral administrated GLP-1 for diabetes, uh, had disappointing phase one data. So we had to kill it. So we had some investors who were ready to invest, but they pulled out. So what do we do? We needed more money, or are we going to close down? So <coughs> the focus was we did have one project left, which was in the area of orphan drug. And it was uh, uh, very focused on, on renal failure in, in, in connection with open surgery. And everything else was put on hold. Now, at that point in time, we had 24 people employed. We had the whole, the whole old uh, setup, the whole 
uh, way of building up a pipeline and a, a biotech company the way that it was done back in the early 2000s. We changed that very quickly uh, over to a virtual organization. We um, hired a new CEO. We had a new st strategy based on only selling off this one asset. We got additional funding from our existing investors. We had uh, the reduction in cost in the burn rate, and we had a virtual, imp uh, virtual organization was implemented. And this is one of the things that you need to consider as well. How much do you need to do in-house and how much can you actually outsource? And I bet you you can outsource more than you think. Uh, there are companies who don't have employees. They outsource everything and they just, or one person to, 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 to keep everything running. Because you you're not the experts in running clinical trials or doing shock studies or doing this or that. So you can actually do more virtually than you can before. And as a trend in this area, this is what venture capital, at least uh, in some degree, is looking at. So we dismissed everybody except the COO, who was, by the way, also the founder. So at least the founder was still there getting his salary. It was cut, but he was, he's getting his salary. Then um, in January, February, we had, uh, a, a, a with the new CEO in there, we had a, a strong review of, um, of the data set that we had, and we had uh, good interest but everybody wanted to see phase two data. Now this is important for you guys out there, is if you want to sell a company or get money funded for it, phase one is in the middle of Death Valley at the moment. It didn't used to be that way, and it may change a little bit back, but at the moment it looks very much slam bam in the middle of Death Valley. So, but there was enough interest out there to continue, so we uh, decided to go into, these are all the clinical studies, but we decided to go into phase, I'll take the next one here. We, we decided to go into um, to phase two and, 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 and pay for that. That's more expensive, of course. We hired an investment banker, uh, Back Bay Life Science Advisors in Boston uh, to manage the process that back in 2010. And uh, it was uh, decided to go for, for that. We started the phase 2B, and there is a phase 2A and a 2B. This is a very important distinction at this point in time uh, because it, it actually showed up that we had decent phase 2A data, but we had started the phase 2 study, and everybody said, that's nice. take all the risk, and then at the very end, jump in and buy or invest. So they wanted to see phase 2B, and we at that time luckily had some investors who, who decided, yes, we want to invest the additional money. It was, uh, it was a fight because not every fund was uh, still in money and had money left, and not everybody could come with as much as they would want to. Uh, so <coughs> fighting between venture capitalists is not a pretty sight. It's best done behind closed doors. Um, but we had a, a good investment banker, and um, they started a formal process. And uh, when we had the due diligence with five companies, they decided to say, yes, let's wait until we have the phase 2B data. So rather than us ending up with everybody saying no, we stopped the process ourselves and said no. We have so big confidence that our next data is going to give us such a big lift in the price that we're not going to sell to you. And that was a pretty important call. We said no before they said, and they knew that there were others involved in the process. This is managing process in that context. That's very important. These are the companies that we contacted, so pretty good field. Um, and that takes a lot of effort and money and time. Time, time, time. Management presentations, conference calls, and with with these ones, you can see there was a lot of late evenings, East Coast, U.S., West Coast, uh, Japan. So, so this is uh, this is what what it ended up with. That we had 
uh, the restructuring back here, we got the phase 2A data, then we started the phase 2B, and it was going to take a whole year to get the data. Time does not move fast in life science. It took a whole year to get the data, and then we got the data. But by the time we got the data, we were ready. We had everything online. We had a, a very clear process which said we do not we do not want an earn out structure, we want upfront payment cash. Stop. That is not easy to ask for, but we, we did it. Um, it's, well, it's easy enough to ask for, it's very more difficult to get it though. Um, we, did, we said we would not send anybody the phase 2B data, we would only do that either on a face-to-face -face or a conference call. We wanted to be in contact with them. If they didn't want to go into those conditions, they would not be able to see the, figure, uh, the, the data. JP Morgan Healthcare Conference every January, excellent time of the year to go to San Francisco. Right, Seppo? See you there in Jan. Um, we had a, a number of meetings there and we built a further relationship. End of January, we had five uh, serious contenders in the play and then we started the process. And it was basically that we had a last, uh, w w we had a letter of intent from Abbott with a price tag of 110 million US dollars upfront cash. Very, very nice. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of people are afraid of, of what's going to happen once you go into the older due diligence. This figure never changed in the process. Once it was there, it was a letter of intent, so it was non-binding, but it did not change. So these, this is what the Americans call in a negotiation, these are straight shooters, right? You can trust them, you can deal with them, and they are very, very professional. Um, the deal needs to be done by April. We had an asset purchase agreement of this size, and we had all the details in place. It got approved by the Abbott's board, and there is a, a, a anti-competition process that needs to be done, and we had a closing in June of this year. That was the last asset in the fund that I was administering, and that was my exit out of venture capital, and I said thank you very much. This was a very nice way of, of finishing off uh, because otherwise I had, I had closed more companies on the negative side than I had uh, returned money to the investors this way. So that was the, the, that was the process, and it was a very clean structure, 110 million at closing. There was a small escrow for a limited amount of time, and it, at the end of the day, came up as one of the top 10, actually the top, the number 10 list of European deals the last five years. So we were very happy. So that was a little bit of experience and learnings and trends. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you for a very, very interesting presentation and not so encouraging though, because uh, <laughs> from what we heard, <laughs> from what we heard it's, it's very, very difficult to pull it through. But nevertheless, uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Many thanks for a nice presentation. Uh, it was clear to me that, or at least I got the idea that you should have all the money before you, you, you should have all the money for the, from the start to the end, to the phase three, basically. Or, or, or have some investors who can come with that. And yeah, without the free that. X's and five that, X's. That, that, is that, that is the nice way to do it. That is the real good way. Yeah, and uh, I understand that European uh, money is, uh, is, uh, is, is something that you could use for that. But, uh, but does the European Union give money for, for phase two and phase three um, trials up front? Or I, I, I mainly have the idea that they, they like would like the business to just to have the initial idea and, and, and then, then you should get the money from... from no, the, 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 uh, the seventh uh, framework program does give to a broad range. Uh, I don't know how much focus on phase three, but uh, definitely phase two. Oh, so you could uh, consider it already when yeah, you're planning. Yeah, yeah, but you have to fit it into some of their boxes, which is, of course, some of times the difficult side to look at what uh, calls there are, what technologies they're promoting at this point in time and so on. Um, so it has to be truly innovative in the first place, but uh, you also need to look at what are they what are they looking for at this point in time. But there are many different programs in, in within the apart from the FP7. 
uh, Eurostars and, and, and others. And uh, most of the companies that I have worked with have been able to get either regional local grants or European grants to, to support it. Uh, basically because I pushed them to send applications, applications, applications in. So at least sometimes they get to know it. But, but when you're in that point, when you know that you meet this venture capitalist uh, and he wants this 5x uh, shares, for instance, um, why continue? Why not just kill the, the processor? Because, because that's not your decision anymore. Because you are no, no longer in charge. By, by the time you, uh, you, when you open the door first time for venture capitalists, you no longer control your company. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the answers. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, please. Tarmo. Yes. Uh, uh, oh, there was. Okay, yeah, sorry. No. Okay. Thank you very much for a interesting presentation. I'm Eskil Söderlin from, from Sweden. So congratulations on selling this Action Pharma. Impressive work. Uh, I saw that you had a investment of 38 million euros and you got back 95 that's three times the money excellent job considering all the companies that you had to close down and all the lost investment what would the average return of investment be in your consolidated uh, fund in in the fund which is now being closed because we're the the the, the incuba venture fund which i was uh, administering um they were one of the funds established in the early 2000, 2002 actually. So um, they started at a bubble time. They started at a time when, when there was not a lot of experience. It was a combined IT life science fund. Um, not, and, and this is not, not to say anything about IT guys in here. None of the IT investments gave any return. <laughs> so, but a couple of the uh, life science investments did, but the majority didn't. So they are negative on their whole fund. The whole f the, this, this was one of the really good examples, but one of the few. So the whole fund, when the, the, the accounts for next year will be published, you will see that it's, it's, it, it will come up with a negative result. So from that point of view, and that is uh, the, the, the Kaufman Foundation came out with a report recently, or an, uh, earlier this year, about the venture capital uh, investing, and their experience is that venture capital investing so far have not returned any money to investors. Hmm. And uh, these yeah. are the guys that we need to go and get yeah. money from. So if they can't get money, uh, uh, th this, is, this is the t harsh part of life. Yeah. So please, by, uh, by, by all means, the, the, the initiatives like this and like many others needs to be followed up with money and more money. Okay, you're talking to wrong people. In Estonia here, this is the, this is the difficult part. But nevertheless, we do have smaller costs also. So, last question, please. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Tarvo Tam is my name. Um, just to kind of follow up this, um, the, the, the case study or the game, rather, you, you, you presented, and it was not really encouraging for, uh, for our early stage uh, investors. But if there were like um, um, sort of business angel out there, some, some fool who would still like to, to invest uh, in, in somewhere in, in the life science, so, and, and comes to you and, and ask uh, for your advice so what it could be. Thank you. I, 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 I make this point so that you can remember something from, from this presentation. Because by knowing the way that things work, you have a better chance of finding ways around it or having that discussion. So if, 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 if I were to p pull in, I, I'm, f I'm currently fundraising for a cancer company that has raised, uh, what about, 5 million euros uh, in, in, uh, in private equity from angels, private equity. And, and they're, they're, they're fools in terms that they have invested with their hearts in, 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 um, in cancer treatment. But helping them to, to, to make the next deal and choosing your next investor and choosing the terms for the next investor and also keeping some of your powder dry. So if, if I were to give an advice to uh, an angel is keep some powder dry so that the, when the next round comes, you can participate in that and you can participate in the next round as well and you can get the 4X at the end or the 3X. So that way you will still make money. So keep some powder dry 
and, and follow all the way through. So when you go into this investment, don't spend all the f one million or half million or 200,000 euros risk money that you allocated in your private money for this. Keep some of it dry and look at what is it going to take all the way over the next five to 10 years. And can I follow? If I can follow, then I can also make money on it because then I'm working on the same terms as the venture investors or who other investors come in. And actually, you might even be able to pull out. I mean, this is there are actually funds out there that are focused on distressed assets where you go in and, and, and find a fund that's running out of time and running out of money, and their, their investors are, are no longer putting more money into it. They have to sell out cheap. So if you, at the end of it, have more money than, than the actual venture investor, that happens, then you could actually do the reverse on them. So it's just being smart. And this, I thought this was about smart start. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, um, I think um, if we can't really keep up the regular process of drug development in Estonia, we, sh we should invent our new, new, wa new ways. One way is to grow our own drugs. So next aspirin comes from <laughs> a pot. Thank you very much. As long as it's legal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.